Well, good evening. We uh, want to thank you for taking the time to come to the first of what will be several town halls focused on the development of our upcoming budget. Uh, the budget process for any organization is important. Obviously, in a school district, it is how we are actually uh, demonstrating our priorities for educating every child, keeping them safe, creating great programs for our students, both uh, for their academic uh, endeavors and their social, emotional, and physical well-being, uh, how we recruit and attract and, retrain and retain great uh, employees, and really, it's our commitment to the community because we are a public education system. We should be developing our budget in the public. Uh, my name is Heath Morrison. I have not had the chance to meet you. I am the proud superintendent of Montgomery ISD. And coming into our district, uh, always asking the question, where are we doing well? Where can we be doing better? Uh, there are a lot of our community, uh, whether they are employees, whether they're community members, parents, We've had quite a bit to say about our budgets uh, over the last several years in Montgomery ISD. Uh, and those uh, ideas and suggestions, and as I was asking questions, came uh, either about why we could not find a way to balance the budget, to what caused the priorities in the budget, um, why is it that we spend in certain ways that may not be similar to other districts. But the overwhelming uh, response when I would ask the question about the budget was, um, a desire for it to be more transparent. And so tonight is the first of many opportunities and efforts that we will be making to have a much more transparent budget process uh, in this upcoming year and in all years in the development of the budget for Montgomery ISD. That is my desire as a superintendent, Chris Lynn's desire as our CFO, who I'll introduce in a second, and most specifically, our Board of Education's desire and commitment to this community. We have three of our board members in attendance this evening, and I want to uh, quickly introduce them. We have our board secretary, Linda Porton, and we have board members, Lori Turner and Sean Dennison. And so we thank them for being here and uh, appreciate your attendance uh, for being here as well. We are recording this town hall because not everyone could actually be at the town hall, so we want to be able to record uh, this town hall, and then we will post it on our website. And uh, again, that is our opportunity to try to demonstrate the transparency we want to bring to this process. Uh, what will also make this a very transparent process is your active involvement, collaboration, and questions. And we will ask, because it is being recorded, um, when we get to the portion where, um, and you can ask at any time uh, to give input questions or suggestions just to come up to the microphone. Uh, not that we can't hear you here, but that way we can make sure it's recorded for anyone who watches the video uh, once it gets posted on our website. So we have a lot of things we want to cover this evening, and we also want to make sure we are taking the opportunity for your input questions and suggestions. And so I want to introduce to you a person who predated me by a couple of months uh, in his arrival to Montgomery ISD, but he has truly been an excellent partner as we look at trying to improve our school district and to make sure uh, that our budget reflects our strategic priorities moving forward. And that is our CFO and Chief Operating Officer, Chris Lynn. Thank you, Dr. Morrison, and thank all of you for, for joining us this evening. Um, tonight's um, agenda uh, is gonna be simple. Uh, we're going to start with uh, some budget basics, uh, just to give you a little bit of information about the school district budget. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, our revenues, expenditures, and fund balance. Okay, We're going to talk about the budget development calendar uh, for the next fiscal year, which will start in, on July 1st. Uh, we will talk about some of the financial challenges that we see on the horizon that we'll deal with uh, with the development of this budget. And then as Dr. Morrison said, one of the, the most important things for us um, this evening is to, to get your questions, your input, your feedback um, as to help guide us as we go through this budget development process, okay? Um, so let's get started tonight with budget basics. And what I mean by that is we're gonna talk about some of the legal requirements behind the budget. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, our fiscal year, and then we're gonna talk about the different funds that the board actually adopts um, in June whenever they officially adopt the budget. So every organization uh, has a budget. Um, ours 
is not only to help us manage our resources, but it's required by Texas Education Code. And that Texas Education Code requires Dr. Morrison uh, to prepare or to cause to be prepared uh, a budget, and that budget has to be prepared by a certain date. And that date is either June 19th or August 20th, depending on the district's fiscal year. Now, as a part of that budget development process, um, we are required to publish a notice of a public meeting to discuss the budget. That is not this meeting, okay? Once the budget has actually been proposed and, and created, we will have a, a separate meeting uh, where the community can discuss uh, the budget at that time. Uh, we're required to post a summary of the, of the proposed budget and conduct that public meeting, and then ultimately, the Board of Trustees will vote to adopt the budget. Now, MISD has selected a July 1 through June 30 fiscal year. Um, that change was made back in 2018-2019. Um, the other option is a September 1 through August 31 fiscal year. Um, since we are a July 1 fiscal year, our budget must be uh, developed by June the 19th, and the board must legally adopt it no later than June the 30th. Uh, so that we can start expending funds on July 1st. When the board adopts the budget, they're actually adopting three different funds. Most of our conversations this evening are going to be about the general fund. And so the general fund is used for the daily maintenance and operation of the district. Oftentimes you'll hear us refer to it as M&O, maintenance and operations. And that includes the salaries, professional and contracted services, and supplies and materials needed to run the district on a daily basis. The second fund that the district uh, adopts is the debt service fund, otherwise known as interest and in sinking. And this fund is used to repay the outstanding debt of the district. Uh, so when the district has a bond issue, we issue debt to pay for those improvements, and this budget is what repays that money um, to the borrowers. Um, our child nutrition fund is the last fund that we adopt, and as, it's, as the name clearly states, that's used to operate our breakfast and lunch program of the district. And so to give you a sample of the budgets that were adopted uh, back in June uh, for the 2020-21 fiscal year, uh, on the left-hand side you see the general fund and you'll see it's broken down by revenues and expenditures. Now keep in mind, at that point when we adopted the budget, it was a deficit budget, meaning the expenditures exceeded the revenues. Um, shortly after the adoption of that budget, uh, we, the board approved three budget amendments in July, August, and September, and we have since balanced the budget, um, meaning that the revenues and expenditures are now equal, okay? Um, so on the left-hand side, you see the general fund, and then on the right-hand side of the page, you see the debt service fund. You can see that the debt service fund is significantly less um, than the general operating fund, because once again, that is just um, the money that we need to repay the debt of the district each year. And then the last budget um, is the student nutrition um, fund, and that is the smallest of all three of the funds um, just under $5 million, okay? So that's an overview of the three different funds. Now let's talk about revenues. We're gonna talk about where do we get our money for our, lo for our budget. We're gonna look at some historical data and we're gonna do some um, comparisons to some of our local districts. And so when we talk about sources of revenue, there's three primary sources of revenue for us. One, is our local source, and that is the largest source of revenue here in Montgomery ISD. Um, over the last 10 years, that has ranged from 75 to 87 percent of the total revenue for Montgomery ISD. Local revenue can be made up of property taxes, um, tuition, and fees. Um, so we do charge um, some tuition for pre-K if they do not qualify. Uh, for, for pre-K services here in the district, they can pay a tuition. Uh, we also rent some of our facilities to different organizations, and so uh, we, we do incur some rental fees. Uh, obviously, interest income, 
and then um, athletic activities. And those are just a few of the different local sources of revenue. Now you will see the note there that the largest source of our local revenue comes from property taxes. And those are based on the property values that are established by the Montgomery County Appraisal District. Just to clarify, the district does not set your property value, okay? The district sets the tax rate, but the appraisal district is the entity who actually determines your property value, okay? Our second source of revenue um, is state revenue, and in Montgomery ISD, that has ranged from 13 to 25 percent of our total uh, revenues. It's, we get payments um, in two methods from the state in the available school fund, um, or the most common one is the foundation school program. I wish that we could leave here tonight um, and everybody be experts in state funding, um, but that's just not gonna happen because the, the way the state funds public education is complicated. Uh, it's based on a lot of, of different formulas, um, but some of the things that they look at in those formulas are property values, uh, average daily attendance, and then enrollments in special programs such as career and technical education, special education, at risk, and then many others as well. Um, our last source of revenue um, is very small, um, and it is some federal reimbursements that we get. And that comes to us in the form of SHARS, which is a special education uh, reimbursement for services provided by some of our uh, special education professionals to our students. And then also through E-Rate, uh, which is a technology reimbursement from the federal government uh, for our uh, network, our technology network, okay? Um, so those are the three sources of revenues. Since I stated that our, Lord, our largest source of revenue here in Montgomery ISD is, the, is our local taxes, I wanted to provide you with some historical information about the tax rate in Montgomery ISD. Back in 2005, 2006, you can see that the total tax rate was $1.66 per $100 of property value. Um, the red um, bar, part portion of the bar is the maintenance and operations and the, the brown is the debt service. So you can see most of that $1.66 was going towards the maintenance and operations. And then through the years, you can see in 07, 08, that dropped to $1.35. That was dictated by a change in the state legislature, okay? And it stayed pretty consistent till you get to 16, 17. You'll notice a little increase. That was after the passing of the 2015 bond. So that INS portion of the, of the rate had to go up a little bit to start paying for those bonds that were approved during that election. And then you get to 1920. So what changed the last couple of years? Um, and that was the passage of House Bill 3 in the Texas legislature. And so a part of that legislation required a reduction in the tax rate. And so you can see in 1920 that the rate dropped to um, $1.3075. And then again, um, this year when we adopted the tax rate, it was required to be reduced even further um, to $1.2798. Okay, so as you can see, the tax rate has gone down. That doesn't necessarily mean that the taxes that you're paying have gone down because more than likely your property values have increased while the tax rate has gone down. This is a comparison of our of how much we receive locally versus how much we receive from the state. And so the green bars are money that's generated on the local level, while the gold bars are money that we receive from the state. So you can see that the majority of all the money that we get um, in revenue is generated locally. And there is um, a correlation between these two because as we generate more money locally, the amount that the state sends us goes down. So as property values are rising and we're collecting more in taxes, the state is going to be sending us less money um, from Austin. And so I just thought that was some interesting information to give you a little background. Um, not every district is like this. Um, this is, you know, um, 
significantly different than most districts. Um, all of our money, the majority of our money is, is from right here, from our local taxpayers. Now, I thought this was interesting information, and all of this has been pulled from PEMS, which is the, the state of Texas uh, public education information, information management system. It compiles all kinds of data, and this is a comparison of revenue per student uh, between Montgomery ISD and some of our neighbors. Uh, so on the list, we have Conroe, Willis, and Magnolia. Going back from 2015-16, you will see Montgomery ISD is the first bar on the left. So we received $7,556 in revenue per student. That same year, Conroe was at $7,813 per student. Willis, $7,704 per student, and Magnolia was $7,684 per student. So you can see that year everybody was pretty well tightly grouped in a general area. But look how things have changed over the years, okay? In 1920, which is the latest year that TEA has actual data on, Montgomery ISD received $7,735 per student in revenue while our neighbors in Conroe had 8,184, Willis 8,382, and Magnolia 8,556. And I think this is important information because as we go through the budget development process, there are going to be things that potentially we can't do. And the question is always, well, X district is doing it, why can't we? And I think the important takeaway from this is not every district is funded at the exact same level. And so this does matter. Um, we do have, we, we're not all on an equal playing field, okay? And so there are certain things that are unique to Montgomery ISD. And so we have to take those things into consideration when we're going through this budget development planning process, okay? Let's talk about our expenditures a little bit. I wanna talk about the different types of expenditures and once again show you some historical information. And so our expenditures, um, thanks to the coding system established by the Texas Education Agency, it allows us to track our expenditures in multiple ways. One of those ways is on the functional level. And when they say function, they mean a general operational area in a school district. It includes a group of related activities. So all of instructional related uh, activities are gonna be in function 11. All of our transportation related activities are gonna be in function 34. And there's many uh, different functional levels and so we'll show you those here in just a minute. The second way that we can track our expenditures is on the object level. And this helps to identify the nature and object of an account transaction. This is where it tells us, for example, if it's a 6100, it's gonna be payroll and benefits. If it's a 6200, then we're talking about a professional or a contracted service, okay? So this helps us really start breaking down our data. And then finally, uh, we can track it based on the program level. And this accounts for the cost of instruction and other services that are directed towards a particular need of a specific set of students. So this is where we start talking about career and technical education, special education, at risk. So we can identify exactly how we're spending um, those dollars for those special programs. This is an example of the expenditures that were adopted by the Board of Trustees um, on June 30th. Um, and as you can see, they range from um, function 11 all the way to function 99. And so when the board adopts the budget, they are adopting the budget based on this functional level. And we're telling the board and the community, this is how we're going to spend the money for this fiscal year. Um, so in function 11, you can see that $47.1 million was budgeted for instructional services. 4.2 million was budgeted for transportation, okay? And so that way we can kind of lay out for you exactly what our intent um, for spending the money will be this fiscal year. This is an example 
of how it's broken down by object. So this chart shows that salary and benefits comprise 80% of the school district budget. So that's how many people, how much we're paying them, and what benefits are they receiving. Accounts for 80% of the entire district budget. Professional and contracted services account for over 13% of the district budget. Now keep in mind that here in Montgomery ISD, we contract out our custodial services and our lawn services. So in most districts, you would see those numbers in the payroll and benefits section. Most school districts, between 80 to 85% of their total budget is spent on payroll and benefits. And we would be right there in that same number if some of those dollars weren't contracted out. And so a lot of people always say, well, you've got all of this money, what are you doing with it? Okay, well, you can see that we're only spending a little under 5% on supplies and materials. Most of it is going towards people and the services that we have to have in order to keep this district operating. Finally, um, this breaks it down by program. And so once again, you can see that over 42% of uh, the total budget was for basic educational services. 4.45% was spent on CTE, a little under 10% on special education. And so all of this is just good information um, to start knowing how the district spends its money um, throughout the budget year. I thought this was interesting, and this was one of the things I first put together whenever I came to Montgomery ISD. As Dr. Morrison said, I beat him here by a couple of months. Um, I was hired, uh, my first day was April the 1st, and so the district was already shut down due to COVID. And so I had a lot of time um, trying to figure out a new district that I didn't know anybody from the house. Um, so I started pulling data, and I wanted to see what do our revenues and expenditures look like on a historical level. And so the green line is the, the revenues, and the orange line are the expenditures. And so you can see starting in 2009 and 10, the green is higher than the orange. That's good. It means you took in more money than what you spent. One thing that was interesting to me was it's rare to see a school district whose revenues are increasing at such a sharp increase. Okay, look at from 2012 to 2018, look how sharply those, that revenue line increases. Okay, that's, that's kind of unique. That meant the district was growing, property values were increasing, there was a lot of development going on in the district. One of the things that um, was a little um, concerning was 12, 13, 13, 14, 14, 15, you can kind of see the orange is above the green. The district was spending more than we were taking in um, during those years. Uh, a little bit of an excess in 15, 16, and then look at 16, 17, 17, 18, okay? The expenditures are right there with the revenues again. Now, one anomaly you see on this chart is in 18, 19. Look at the big gap between the, the revenues and the expenditures. Remember earlier I said the district changed its fiscal year in 2018, 2019, okay? That meant the district got to record 12 months worth of revenue, but only had to book 10 months worth of expenditures, okay? So that is what caused that significant gap and we'll, show, uh, we'll go into more detail here in just a second when we talk about fund balance. So what is fund balance? That's a term you hear a lot. Fund balance can be thought of as the district's savings account, okay? It should be used to fund one-time expenditures. It should not be used to fund recurring annual expenditures like payroll. It should be there to help out when you need um, to bridge that gap when maybe your revenues aren't there, um, but it should not be used to fund pay raises or payroll. The recommended balance um, is three to six months of operating expenditures. Montgomery ISD has, for easy numbers, roughly a $78 million budget. Three 
to six months of that budget means we should have 19.5 million at a minimum to $39 million as a maximum. On this chart, you'll see for 2019, 2020, because that was the last audited year, because uh, we're still in the 2021 fiscal year, Montgomery ISD reported a fund balance of $19.7 million. So we are only $200,000 above the three month minimum recommended fund balance, okay? So let's look at the history. We can see back in 2019, we had $7 million. So 19 million is a significant improvement from where we were back in 2009 and 10. You follow it along, you had a decrease in 10, 11, a little bit of an increase in 11, 12, stayed relatively steady until you see that big jump in 18, 19. Once again, that's when the district changed its fiscal year, okay? Had it not been for that change in fiscal year where we added $8.1 million, okay, our fund balance would not be at the level it is now. Okay? So I just say that because that, this fund balance will come up here in just a minute as one of our challenges moving forward for the district. So let's talk about the de budget development process and the calendar that we're going to use to develop the 21-22 fiscal year budget. We start with what are our objectives. And as Dr. Morrison said, he and I are in lockstep on this, along with our board of trustees. The most important thing to us is transparency with our community, okay? We want to make sure that the community understands how we develop a budget and how our money is being spent. We want to have input from all stakeholders Obviously, we can't create a budget without talking to principals and staff. Ultimately, the board has some input and they're the ones who officially adopt the budget. But we also want to have that input from our community. And so we've organized an event like tonight uh, to provide that opportunity for input, questions, and comments. The other thing that we want to do, you always want to try and present a balanced budget. Sometimes that doesn't happen. That's what we have fund balance for, remember, to help bridge those gaps when, when revenues may be a little short of, of where we need them to be. But if we, can't if we can't deliver a balanced budget, then we need to deliver a plan on how we're going to balance that budget, okay? Um, so because uh, a recurring deficit budget is just not acceptable, okay? Um, and so let's look at the budget development calendar for, for this year. So here we are tonight with our budget town hall. We're kind of kicking off the budget process this evening. Um, later this month, I will develop the 21-22 preliminary revenue estimate. And I know that you've heard us say during the year of COVID, everything is subject to change. I say preliminary revenue estimate because this is a legislative year. Okay. The Texas legislature is currently meeting in Austin, and we have no idea what changes they're going to make to school finance this session. Um, so we are, right now, we're going to operate under the rules that are currently in place, and then we will adjust as we need to once bills and, and action comes out of Austin. March the 2nd, the board has a quarterly workshop, so we will update them on our preliminary revenue estimate and other budget items. March the 8th, I will distribute budget worksheets to campus and department budget managers, and those will be the forms that they will utilize to help um, establish their campus and department budget. Now remember, 80% of our budget is based on people, um, so a large portion of that will already be taken care of. March 30th, um, may be changing to the 23rd, depending on exactly when the March board meeting is. Uh, we will be presenting a demographic study to the board. Um, and so this is very important uh, for the budget because it will help guide us for the next several years on what our projected um, increase in enrollment potentially may be um, to the district. It will help us determine um, zoning for our schools um, and so it, it, this is a very critical piece um, to the budget process. 
on April 13th, we will have our second budget town hall. And so we will provide the latest update to the community about the budget and any information um, that has come out of Austin um, so far this legislative session. And then on April the 19th, campus and department budget worksheets will be returned to my office. And me and my staff will get busy compiling all of that information so that when the board meets on May 18th, we present to them a preliminary budget for fiscal year 21-22. At that point in time, that's when we will do the notice that we talked about earlier of when the public meeting will be held um, that will outline when the community can come and provide comments to the board uh, before the adoption of the budget. And then on June 15th, if all goes well, we get four hands on the Board of Trustees to, to raise their hand and approve the budget um, so that our employees can continue to be paid come July the 1st. Um, so that's a real quick overview of our budget calendar. Now we have another activity going on right now in our strategic plan, and I'm going to let Dr. Morrison talk about how those two events play hand in hand. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm excited about not only the work that we are beginning on the budget, but the work that has been ongoing around our strategic plan. Our board in October passed five key priorities. And if you think about uh, your vision of your school district as a destination, then what they put forward for our district to focus on are around five goals. One on academic achievement, excellent academic achievement for every student. The second goal around the safety of our students and staff. The third goal around being good fiduciary officers of taxpayer dollars and using our resources wisely and efficiently in the operation of our school district. The fourth goal around how we recruit, attract, retain, and grow excellent employees. And the fifth goal around our community uh, uh, commitment to communication, customer service, and strong cultures across the school district. So that forms the backbone of our evolving strategic plan. And the exciting thing is right now, just as we're trying to actively get public engagement in our budget, we are doing the same with the development of our strategic plan. We have five task forces, one for each one of those goals. Those task forces are being led by senior staff and principals. On every task force, there are teachers, support staff, parents, students, community members. And uh, it's very exciting to watch that work. As a matter of fact, I popped in one today on goal one, which is our focus on academic achievement. Justin, there had to be almost 40 people in that meeting uh, giving their input, their suggestions about how our district can go from where we are, which is a very, very good school district, to our destination to be a perpetually great school district and the premier school district in the state of Texas. So the reason why that work on the strategic plan is important is because just like in your household, you have to have a plan. You have to ask yourself, what are the things we have to spend on? What are the things we would like to spend on? And what are the things we'd love to spend on? And so usually in most households, you sit around the kitchen table and you're like, well, we need to pay rent or mortgage. That's a have to do. We have to put food on the table. That's a have to do. We have to pay the utilities. That's a have to do. And so you start to say, what are the things we must commit to? And then if there's money left over, then you can start saying, what are some of the things we'd love to do? Uh, the car keeps on acting up. It may be time for a new car. And so you start to compile that list. And then you get to some of the things, and sometimes every once in a while, the budget allows for some things you'd love to do. So back in a world prior to COVID, when you could actually say, hey, let's go on a vacation, it was, uh, are we going to go to uh, the Grand Canyon or are we going to Hawaii? Those are some of the things you'd love to do. The challenge is, is that when your budget has more of the things you love to do and not as many of the things as you have to do. And that happens when you don't have a plan. Our strategic plan will be our commitment to the community of how we are prioritizing our actions, our focus, and our budget. And so doing the strategic plan collaboratively at the same time as we're developing our budget, those two documents, the strategic plan and the budget, must be aligned. If they're not, then we either have a strategic plan that won't be worth the paper it will be printed on because it's not a reflection of the priorities as reflected in the budget, 
or we'll have a budget that does not reflect the priorities that have been established in the strategic plan. So as you can see on these different dates, just as we're coming out as we are tonight to ask for input, suggestions, and answer questions about our evolving budget process, we are constantly asking questions, constantly asking input, constantly asking for your support and help in developing our strategic plan. So these two items must be done at the same time. It's a lot of work and there's a lot of people who are working their day job plus, uh, but it's exciting to think about these two things coming together. In May, not only will we be presenting a draft budget for our board of trustees for their consideration, but we will also be presenting the draft of our strategic plan. The two documents must be aligned and done at the same time. Chris. So let's talk about some of the challenges that we're gonna face um, as we go through this budget development cycle. We've probably already heard a lot of talk about compensation across the district. Um, we have compiled uh, salary data um, from uh, the Texas Association of School Boards uh, that shows we have lagging salaries at all levels of the organization. And I don't want to speak for Dr. Morrison, um, but I have a feeling he would tell you that that is one of, if not the top priority for his budget that he will recommend to the school board. And so one reason um, you know, that's a priority is the district has, has started to lose really good people um, to neighboring districts because of pay. And so we want to stop that trend and we want to make sure that our employees are compensated rightfully um, a very competitive wage. Um, the second challenge is going to be staffing levels. Um, at the same time we were compiling salary data, uh, we had a staffing report um, that was also done by the Texas Association of School Boards. And you'll be hearing more information about that shortly. But that staffing report shows that the district has some areas of excess staff. However, it also points out that we have areas where we need additional staff. Um, so remember, 80% of our budget is how many people we have, how much we're paying them, and what kind of benefits they're getting. Um, so staffing and compensation are going to be big challenges moving through this budget. I already talked about limited fund, ba fund balance availability. Currently, our fund balance is just slightly above the three-month minimum recommended amount. Okay. So that's something that we need to work on. Enrollment. We know with COVID, we experienced um, a decline in our early childhood enrollment. So pre-K, K, first grade, um, that's where our numbers were, were drastically down this year. And so it makes it hard when we're trying to forecast revenues. Um, will those kids come back? Will we get back to more of a normal cycle in 21-22? Uh, we certainly hope so. We've seen... Um, increases here lately in our enrollment, so we think we're headed um, towards that trend, and especially for 21-22. The next one is recapture. Now, not to get into a whole lot of finance terminology, but recapture is a situation in which when our property values are rising to a certain level, we have to send money to Austin uh, for them to distribute to other districts. Okay. Obviously, we don't like doing that. And that's local taxpayer money um, that we have to send to Austin and that they send to other districts for their benefit. Um, right now, we are, we are close um, to that line. Um, so we will have to see how 21-22 plays out to see if that is um, a, an issue for us next year. Also, I mentioned the legislature's in session. We never know what's coming out of Austin. Um, and so we have no idea what kind of legislative changes may be headed our way, um, either academically, um, financially. Um, so we'll have to adjust and, and modify uh, as we go through this budget process, okay? Our portion of the comments are done. 
Um, so we would love for you to provide some feedback, comments, questions, input, um, whatever you would like to say. We're here to listen, um, so don't be bashful. I'll actually come to you, so that way you can sit and be, and I'll stick here. I'll, I'll hold on to it so that way we're not, we're, we're monitoring our guidelines. So. Um, clearly, the uh, revenue per student is a, is a major issue. If you look at the Conroe District, they've got lots of businesses that essentially have no students for all of that revenue, where we are pretty much a bedroom community and 15, 20 years ago, this area was largely, I live in Walden, Walden was largely a retirement community with no students. We now have, what, 700 plus in an elementary school in Walden. Uh, so it, it just seems like, especially on recapture, that, that the state's got to take some of that you know, dynamics. We're, we're growing students. We've added schools uh, because of the magnitude. Uh, how, how do we communicate that to Austin if that's we, what it we takes? We send you to Austin. Sure. So obviously Dr. Morrison and Justin can speak to this. Um, the board adopted its first, I believe, legislative platform. Um, and so I'll let Dr. Morrison talk more about that. I'm really proud of our uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, they see the need to advocate for our district and, uh, and they directed us to work uh, and, and develop a legislative platform that was adopted uh, recently. And that legislative platform puts a lot of focus around making sure that funding is equitable across the state of Texas. There's lots of different factors that go into how schools are funded. Uh, and so there are size of schools, there's a uh, population of students, whether those students are uh, economically disadvantaged, speak English as a second language, or served in special education. So there's lots of different reasons for why there's different levels of funding. Uh, the Texas formula is very complicated, and HB3, which was the legislation passed in the last legislature, was supposed to bring more clarity to it, and we are very early in trying to decipher um, what happened that was a benefit for Montgomery ISD and quite frankly, what might be a challenge. Uh, if you go back to the slides that showed the comparisons, uh, if you look at the difference between how Magnolia receives fundings, local, state, federal, versus ours, it's almost a $1,000 per student difference. Well, what does that mean? If we were funded at the same level as Magnolia, it would be about $9 million, Chris. And so as you're trying to decide, well, what would you do with $9 million? Well, you could add lots of different programs. You could enhance uh, the compensation of our employees. You could add to the fund balance. You'd have a lot of different options. Uh, so not saying that, um, that Magnolia is not funded the way it should be, but there are differences within even Montgomery County uh, that we're trying to understand and how much of that is historical, how much of that is as a direct result of HB3, we have to look at that and our legislative platform is directed by the board will make us very active either virtually or in person in Austin. Uh, so it's something that we have to, we just can't be passive about it and we will not be under this board of trustees. And speaking of board of trustees, we had a, another board member uh, sneak in, we have Mr. Mike Hopkins back here. So Mike, welcome and thanks for attending. Other questions, comments, suggestions, ideas? I feel like Oprah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually have a couple of questions, if that is okay. Okay, I'm going to read them. <clears throat> Security department salaries alone total over $1 million, according to the MISD budget workshop from last June. Meanwhile, the district as a whole reported a 0.6% deficit across the board for all salaries and benefits compared to last year, which totals over $348,000. This 6.6% deficit for district-wide salaries could potentially be accounted for two to three times over by a decent reduction in campus police presence. In the light of the current salary crisis that the district faces and in light of the increased pressures and demands on teachers due to COVID and in light of a decrease in on-campus student population, how can we justify paying $1 million for an entire in-house police department 
and the hiring of additional officers while actual educators are overworked, understaffed, and underpaid. Um, so, I appreciate the question, and uh, again, the board has set five priorities. Uh, the academic achievement of our students uh, is our single highest priority in terms of what we have schools to do. But the greatest commitment I think most mom and dads want us to be diligent about each and every day is the safety of their children and the safety and responsibility we have to our students and staff. And as a parent myself, before I care about how much English, math, social studies, science my child learns, I want to make sure that they're safe. So I think we always have to look at and ask the question in any budget, are we prioritizing school safety enough? And it's not just with police officers um, and school security, which is very important, but also other areas like social and emotional safety. Uh, guidance counselors, other things that add to the wellness and safety of our students and staff. Uh, we have actually decreased the amount of resource to school security. Uh, and the number of police officers last year in the budget process was actually reduced by two officers. We're trying to decide is that appropriate or is there a need to actually add uh, to school security. Uh, as we look at how we are resourced with security uh, compared to other districts, both regionally um, in, the, uh, in the Montgomery area and also uh, the study that uh, Chris mentioned, which looks at staffing levels that was done by TASB, uh, compares us to, I think, about 10 other school districts that are about our size and also uh, our demographics. And so that's where we're looking, kind of where you're pointing us to, are there any areas where we are overstaffed? or potentially understaffed. School security did not immediately emerge as one of those areas where we're understaffed, uh, but it also didn't suggest it's an area where we're overstaffed, uh, but we have to continue to look. We will focus on that study and looking at every efficiency and effectiveness that we can uh, to, to really promote uh, compensation, and especially looking first at compensation of our teachers. So, uh, Again, I, don't, I hope that answers your question. Chris, anything that you wanted to say from a budget standpoint? No, I think, um, you know, when we're putting the budget together, there's nothing, there's no conversation that's off the table. Yeah. Um, that's been our commitment from day one. Um, and so we are looking at every single thing that this district spends money on and trying to find ways to become more efficient, um, provide better service um, at a reduced cost. Um, so um, that's just, we're, we're looking at, at every single thing. And we had a board workshop um, earlier in the fall, and our consultant, who was a great consultant, brought up the issue of sacred cows. And the question was, do you have any sacred cows? And, and everyone's like, oh, of course we don't. Well, when you start to do a budget, and you're starting to say, well, we want to prioritize adding to this program or adding compensation for this group of folks, and in order to pay for that, we want to potentially consider reducing this level of service or maybe scaling back this program. That's where you do have some things, whether it's the board, whether it's the staff, whether it's the community, you learn very quickly what are priorities. And, and so that's why these type of meetings are really important, to go out and, and as we start to say, this is where we're projecting our revenue, here is where we're starting to put a focus on this upcoming budget. In order to achieve these priorities, here are some things that we are recommending. We have to do that with public input. If I present a budget to the board in May, I think the first question they're going to ask me is, how much public engagement was there? And if they were limited or little, um, that would not be a budget that I think would have much of a chance of succeeding. So um, these meetings and those kind of considerations are really important. Other questions, suggestions, ideas? You had two, so you had a second one. I actually have three, if that's okay. all right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can you clarify how much funding of the MISD Police Department comes from the Department of Justice grants or other state agencies? And how much of these funds are allocated in conjunction with the local taxpayer dollars in order to cover the $1 million in salaries of the MISD Police Department at its current size? Do you want to ask your third question too? Sure, okay. 
Can you describe any specific measurable justifications or advantages for an increase in police staff and presence, particularly at elementary campuses? And how would said justifications be reconciled with parents and staff concerns about the culture of fear and criminalization that this creates? I can take the last one, Chris, if you can take the second one. Sure. Um, again, reminder that in the budget that was just passed, um, there was actually reduction of officers. Uh, one of the things that when I became superintendent, I actually became a superintendent right after the budget had been passed. Uh, I did work with uh, Mr. Lynn and staff and we were able to balance the budget in September. Uh, but part of the initial budget process was actually a reduction of school police. So the, the number of school police has not gone up, it's actually gone down. And that's something we have to look at. We have to uh, make sure that we have a comfort level that, um, that we are staffed appropriately in school police, the way we have to look at everything that we have, whether it's uh, special education programs, gifted and talented, uh, elementary teachers, uh, athletic departments. We have to look at everything. And the question should always be, are we staffed appropriately? Um, in terms of school police, you know, there are school districts that have their own police there are school districts that contract services. And when we started the process of actually uh, looking at a vacancy with our school chief, uh, we did a very thorough examination of what was best for the district, either to keep our school police in-house, our own Montgomery ISD force, or to contract services. And while money did not drive the conversation, um, it was at that time more expensive to contract services uh, through uh, uh, organizations that currently operate, uh, in other words, uh, Districts 1 and 5, for example, provide contract services. Uh, we did make the decision to keep the school police. We did hire uh, a, a new chief of police. And one of the budget processes that, um, as Chris already mentioned, is we are working with that school chief to ask that question after he's been here now uh, for several months. What's his assessment of how we're staffed? Um, are we appropriately staffed? Do we need to add uh, officers either for additional campus coverage or uh, potentially to have some sort of night rotation? Or are we appropriately staffed and potentially uh, there might be other areas that we need to focus on uh, for school safety? Uh, so we'll have that conversation uh, with the chief as we will with every department head across Montgomery ISD. And your second question was primarily focused on Department of Justice grants and how much revenue we receive from that. Um, obviously, I don't have that number on the top of my head tonight, but I'll be happy to, to research that information and, and get that to you. Um, if you can see me after the meeting and, and give me your contact information and we'll, we'll share that information uh, with the community. Other suggestions, ideas? When do we find out about Robin Hood? That's the Robin Hood, question. Chapter 41, Recapture. Um, yeah, um, Chris, do you want to give an update on that? Sure. So it, it's a process, okay? It, as I like to say, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so we turned in our last piece of information. Uh, it was due January the 15th. Um, so we're expecting to hear an update either this month or first part of next month, so February or March. And just to share um, with this audience in the community, um, like I said, doing the school budget is much like doing your household budget. So you sit down and again, what are the things we have to do, would like to do, would love to do? And just like in your household, you need to try to account for all of the expenditures that you know are coming. I think the most frustrating part of um, chapter 41 Robin Hood, recapture, however it's titled, is that you just don't know if you're going to be recaptured, if you're going to be Robin Hooded, if that's even a word, and then how much that's going to be. So as you're trying to be meticulous, thoughtful, and planful with your budget, you don't know actually how much money to set aside. And in some years, it's been very little. In some years, it's been millions of dollars. And that lack of certainty and clarity presents a huge challenge in trying to develop the budget. Uh, and again, we just want to make sure we're very specific because sometimes you hear uh, a school district talk about Chapter 41, Recapture Robin Hood, and they, send, they say send money back to the state. 
Um, the money is not back to the state. It belongs to the taxpayers of Montgomery County. And as you're paying your taxes, there's an assumption that, uh, especially when it comes to funding, that, uh, that it will be within the district. Uh, chapter 41 takes money from the county, sends it to the state when there's already mechanisms within the state budgeting process uh, for monies to be distributed in, in different ways like that. So uh, we hope soon we're no if we are going to have to be uh, forced to look at recapture. Uh, but again, it's not just the amount, it's the uncertainty, not knowing when and how much that makes it very problematic in the budgeting process. And, and let me explain just a little bit. This, the uncertainty was really caused by House Bill 3. Uh, before House Bill 3, I mean, it was pretty consistently that Montgomery ISD was a Chapter 41 district and, and was, um, sending money to the state. Uh, the changes enacted by House Bill 3 moved that line. And so the first year, 1920, uh, we did not have a recapture payment. The preliminary information that we got from TEA for 2021 said that we owed zero. However, they were still making us go through the process in case the calculations turned out that we did owe. So we're just in that situation where we're so close to the line, we don't know if we're over it or under it. Um, and and we, we use some of the, the outdated terminology. We talk about Chapter 41 and, and Robin Hood, and those are some terms prior to House Bill 3, but that's what everybody knows, so that's why we continue to say that language. Uh, but there is new language um, that was established as a part of House Bill 3, and, and so we'll, we will start from, from my office doing a better job of educating on those terms and using that modern terminology um, so that we're speaking in the, in the correct vernacular. Recapture. Yeah. Uh, title? This is for people in the audience. Title, title two funds, what, what's the status on that? What do we use from that? And my second question would be a big thing that's come up in some of these committee meetings is professional development. Mm -hmm. So does that, is that something that goes on those worksheets to the particular principals or does it go through department heads or is it a district wide? Because that seems to be a recurring factor in trying to get everybody on the same page for all these improvements that we want to have happen. Okay. So what does that look like cost wise moving forward? Sure. So, um, the conversations tonight were primarily centered around um, general fund monies, uh, so our local monies. Um, and they, the small portion of the federal revenue that I spoke about was not um, sp specific to any title program. That's additional money that we get from the federal government uh, based on um, socioeconomic status of students in the district. And so there's multiple titles, um, Title I, Title II, Title III, go on and on. Um, title II, I just, we do have a, an individual in the district, um, Dr. Amy Busby, um, who oversees the, those federal programs. Um, and so she would be the person who could really logically lay out um, all of the plans for each one of the, the title programs. Um, so I will be happy to, to get some information from her and, and communicate exactly how those title funds are used um, for the specific titles. Um, Title II is uh, generally used for staff development. Um, so just keep in mind that we don't get a huge, a, a very large amount of title money um, because of the socioeconomic status of our district. Um, but we can, we can certainly provide you with some information about all of the title programs and how those funds are used. In most districts, uh, the smallest amount federal, state, local, uh, comes from federal. And it is usually through some title funding and it is the most prescriptive. In other words, you have very little discretion. This is the money, this is how it must be used. Uh, the most uh, uh, funding that you get that you actually have the greatest discretion around is local funding. And, and so even though uh, we don't get much Title II uh, or Title IV funding from the federal government, uh, the local funds that we do use as we develop a budget and especially as we develop our strategic plan, especially as goal four is not only about attracting 
recruiting, retaining, but growing our employees, that commitment to professional development um, will be a huge focus. And, and quite frankly, while compensation will be what causes people to first start to look at either coming to our district or potentially leaving our district, it's that commitment to grow them as professionals, to honor them, uh, to build their capacity that will keep this as a preferred destination. So we will have a huge commitment to professional development. And, and then to touch on your other portion of that question. So yes, it is a multiple phased approach. So um, there is some professional development that is identified by our curriculum and instruction department, um, but yet the campuses are given an allotment that they can choose um, to have some specific professional development for their campus if they want. So it's not just one or the other, it's, it's a multi-layered um, curriculum department, campus principal, um, title funds, um, so it's, there's multiple avenues for staff development. And again, the focus, if we do professional development right, and our intention to strategic plan is to do it right, it's not one and done, it's job embedded, it's ongoing, uh, and it really addresses the unique need of the uh, employee. Just like we want to have a personalized instructional program for every child so that they get what they need to go from where they are to where they need to be, every employee need, has unique needs. And so while sometimes there are training that we have to do required by the state or there are some district initiatives where we need to have everybody trained, um, more often than not, it really does speak to what are the unique needs of the professional, what is it that they need, have they had a chance to have voice in that, and then can we provide the resources so that they can grow and, uh, and really remain engaged in the latest practices that will help them prosper in the classroom or supporting teaching and learning. Okay, um, similar to you, how you were talking about how with the police department you looked at having our in-house or contract, have we looked at that with our cleaning crew and have we looked at a three-tier system for transportation to save money? Yes and yes. So um, we, are, we have been actively involved with um, reviewing the, the contract with our custodial um, service. Um, and so Dr. Morrison and I are attempting to uh, schedule a, a meeting with their leadership um, later this month so that we can have some further conversations. Um, I have already made my expectations known um, to them, but we want to take that conversation a step further. Uh, so yes, we are looking at that. Um, and to help explain the three-tier system, in case you don't know what she's referencing, um, most districts operate a three-tier system in transportation. Here in Montgomery ISD, we operate a two-tier system, which means all secondary go at one time and all elementary go at one time. Uh, most districts utilize a three-tier system which separates high school, elementary, junior high, and they can go in any order, um, but you break those three bands into three different route segments. Um, and the, the purpose of that would be to see if there are some efficiencies. It reduces the, potentially reduces the number of buses that need to be run. Um, so transportation is always one of those areas where we have a hard time um, attracting and retaining um, bus drivers. Um, so it helps us with our staffing levels, but it also helps um, reduce the number of buses that need to be on the road. Um, so it reduces our operational cost and it reduces our cost necessary to replace the fleet. Um, so yes, that is um, being considered. And not only is it potentially a savings and helps us be more efficient, but the goal with the strategic plan is where can you find alignment? And there's actually research that suggests if you have a three-tiered system, then usually people are like, oh, we'll start with the high school. But actually there's a lot of research and it gets into circadian rhythms and other things, but basically teenagers need to sleep and they actually should go last. But traditionally in most school districts, we have high schoolers go first, elementary go last. Elementary brains are wired early in the morning, they're ready to go. And so there's actually research that says your academic performance in your schools um, not, not, could be benefited by changing that. So you can save money, increase academic achievement. 
that all sounds great, but it has to be done with a lot of community engagement. And so a lot of parents right now depend on school being at this time, being able to drop off kids at that time. So we're look at it for all of those reasons, but we just want to be thoughtful. We're doing a lot of things at one time with budget, strategic plan, and uh, there is a pace of change that we have to be cognizant of, but we are going to look at that three-tiered system for sure. So, um, okay, one last question, and you have four questions. Well, my question is in response to your response. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, so you mentioned that the chief of police are primarily, he's the one that has oversight in that and, de and decides what the needs are for that department specifically. But I would like to know what accountability measures are in place in order to ensure that we are not overspending on a false sense of security. Um, so let me backtrack for a second. Um, the chief of police will have input into recommendations for uh, security and school police, the same as the director of transportation will do that with transportation, the director of special education will do. So everyone will have input, and the expectation is they will seek input both from employees, community, um, and really bring thoughtful recommendations to increase efficiency, performance, and if possible, have savings. Um, and the chief of police will do that as well. Um, I, I, I guess I will challenge your concern around a false sense of security. Um, school police, whether it's contracted, whether it is in-house, does provide the opportunity to keep our students and staff safe. And, you know, we've had the, maybe the only positive thing around COVID-19 and the impact of shutting down schools has been having less of the what seemed like a plethora of school shootings that we were experiencing at seemingly almost every other week. Uh, school police can be a huge deterrent to that. School police can be a way to uh, make sure that we are mindful of things that intrude on the safety of our campuses, whether that's drugs, weapons, or other things that we do not want on our campuses. Uh, again, so whether that school police is in-house or contracted, uh, I don't think it's money misspent. It has to be efficient and it has to be aligned to strategic goals. Uh, but here's the one thing I will agree with you on. If anybody stands up and says, I guarantee that there is no chance that your child can ever come to any harm at school, that we have covered every opportunity that would cause harm on a bus, on the campus, or any school activity, I would suggest you really challenge their sincerity or their facts. What you should expect your superintendent, the chief of police, the school board, or any principal is to say we are doing everything we can proactively, thoughtfully, research-based to keep your students and our staff and our community safe. We do believe that school police is a huge component of it. It's not the only part. Uh, and as we develop our budget and a strategic plan, we will want to spend appropriately on school security right now through school place, but there are many, many other areas that we have to spend on as well. So I think philosophically we're in kind of the same place, but I, I just don't want to uh, make the uh, alignment that our commitment to having a school police uh, absolutely guarantees school safety. I think it's a huge commitment to it, uh, but there's a lot of other things we have to bring to the table. So. Speaking of commitments, um, we said that we would have um, from six to seven. We are so grateful that you have taken the time to be with us this evening, um, and I really do appreciate that. And I hope um, that this was helpful. Uh, we really kind of planned this first one to be a budget one-on-one -on -one so that you can see the same information that we're looking at. How do we derive our resources? How are they currently being spent? And then the next budget town hall uh, will really uh, be an update of, well, here's what we're projecting as possible revenues from our strategic planning, from the initial work with our principals and department heads. Here are some of our initial thoughts around what we might want to prioritize uh, in our budget. Um, and as usual, the, the requests will probably exceed the anticipated revenue, so then we're going to have to start sharing some ways potentially we could try to find the savings to do some of the things that we feel the need to do. Uh, and then the most important that meeting will be, of course, getting your input, your suggestions, your ideas. And uh, we're a better school district when we have meetings like this, and we're honored and privileged to have you spend part of your time with us here this evening. Mr. Lynn, final word? Yeah, just once again, to echo Dr. Morris, um, thank you. Um, we don't 
I personally don't know if this has been done before in this district or not, but um, thank you for coming out and providing your input. Um, we will definitely have these conversations and gather this information and get it out to the community with Justin's help. So um, thank you for your time tonight and look forward to seeing you at future meetings.